equity and inequality are concepts that I've thought about for a long time, a really long time. And you probably have too. I mean, we are all gathered here in Philadelphia, the poorest big city in America, right? Well, it's actually my desire to do something about poverty that led me to a career in economic development. And for the most part, I'm pretty happy with the path I chose, but not entirely. You see, economic development is no panacea. And while I do believe that a lot of our policies and practices have led to a reduction in poverty and inequality, I also know that some of our practices have led to an increase in poverty and disparity. Now, I didn't just wake up one day and realize that economic development wasn't necessarily leading to a reduction in poverty and inequality. It took a lot of lessons and experiences for me to come to these conclusions. I spent eight years inside the system, what some would call the belly of the beast, the Philadelphia Department of Commerce. And we had programs to support small businesses and revitalize commercial corridors and to foster economic opportunity. And we also had programs to bring in bigger businesses and jobs, and sometimes we'd provide incentives. And we would sometimes pay companies to stay in Philadelphia if they were considering relocating and taking those jobs elsewhere. Well, we won some and we lost some. Economic development entities throughout the country participate in this practice of providing one-off incentives to companies in exchange for jobs, hoping that their bet will reap a return on investment. But the reality is, oftentimes, cities are just competing against themselves. You see, in Philadelphia, we might offer a half a million dollars or a million dollars to a company for them to bring their office or their headquarters to Philadelphia, and we've done that before. But at the same time, our entire annual budget for a small business commercial corridor facade program is less than a million dollars for the whole city. And over 80 commercial corridors, home to thousands of small businesses, are eligible for that program. Now, I spent a lot of time on commercial corridors when I was at the Department of Commerce. And I would notice the dilapidated benches built in the 1970s a lack of trees or lighting or signage, crumbling sidewalks. You've been to these places. It makes you wonder, what the heck is going on here? So I would sometimes think to myself, how is it that we're providing these large incentives to these big businesses when some neighborhoods in Philadelphia get pretty much no investment for decades? But the reality is, economic development has long been about the notion of trickle-down economics. The idea that if we bring more jobs and more businesses, that will bring more dollars to city coffers, and government will make more investments, and that'll trickle down and chip away at the poverty rate and inequality. But let's face it, that's not what's happened at all. What's actually happened is perverse. You see, since 2000, the United States has experienced the longest trajectory of growth in our entire history. But in 2018, we hit the highest level of disparity ever recorded. 2018, before a global pandemic came and rocked the economic security of millions of Americans. And what we've actually seen in many cities as they've experienced growth is a shrinking of the middle class, an increase in poverty, and what many would call apartheid-like conditions. So let's face it, in neighborhoods like North Philadelphia and Southwest Philadelphia that struggled when I was a little girl growing up in University City, those neighborhoods continue to struggle today. And those neighborhoods got to be the way they are after decades of segregationist policies like urban renewal, which actively divided black communities and discriminatory lending pro practices like redlining. So let me take you back to when I was first starting to learn about economic development. It was 1996, and I was 20 years old when I first traveled down to Quito, Ecuador. I didn't just want to read about places like Quito, Ecuador. I wanted to live among the people. I wanted to study at a local university in Spanish. I wanted to work at a local nonprofit. I wanted to know what it was like to live and work in a country that experienced extreme poverty, had underinvested infrastructure, and limited resources. And more than anything, I wanted to understand poverty and figure out what role I could one day play 
to contribute economic opportunities to places like Quito, Ecuador. Well, as it would turn out, I would end up going back for three more years after college. I experienced and learned so much while I was in Ecuador. Two presidents were overthrown. And I lived through the worst economic recession that Ecuador had ever experienced. It was so bad that Ecuador had to get rid of its own currency, the Sucre, for the US dollar. I still remember to this day in my economics class, our professor gave us an assignment. He gave us a simplified version of the national budget. And he said, you're the president of Ecuador. Come up with a plan. So I looked at this, this budget, and I noticed one number jump out at me more than any other on the page. And it was the national debt payment. It was about 50% of the budget. So as I got to work on my assignment, I thought about how every time Ecuador would negotiate an international loan package, it always came with requirements to cut social spending or education or subsidies on gasoline or electricity. So inevitably, as Ecuador would negotiate what they called austerity measures, swaths of Ecuadorians would take to the streets and they would protest the increase in cost of living that would come with those loans. When I lived in Ecuador, about 50% of the population lived in poverty. I saw poverty everywhere I went. So it was almost impossible to imagine how Ecuadorians could survive any increase in cost of living. And it definitely didn't seem fair. But Ecuador needed to pay its bills. So what would I do if I was the president of Ecuador and I faced these choices? I had no idea. What would you do? Well, I never imagined that years later I would find myself in the seat of Commerce Director for the city of Philadelphia after having, after having just been told that my budget was being cut by 50%. This was no academic exercise. This was real. It was the spring of 2020, and Philadelphia's budget had a huge hole in it left by COVID. Over 100,000 Philadelphians were left unemployed, and many of our businesses were shuttered or on life support. And then, a few months later, as we all recall, George Floyd was tragically murdered. Protests broke out throughout the country, and many of our commercial corridors in Philadelphia were left severely damaged, especially in black and brown communities. The need for economic recovery dollars just kept on growing, just as my budget was shrinking. So during those first few weeks, I won't lie, I had to do almost everything I could to stave off a panic attack. But as time went on, that anxiety turned into resolve. I thought about how that time in Ecuador living through that economic meltdown had kind of prepared me for this moment. And I thought about that budget exercise back in college and how that had been a glimpse of some of the decisions that I would have to make later in my career. And so, in that moment, facing the biggest challenge that I'd ever faced in my entire career, I knew that I couldn't let happen what I had seen happen in Ecuador. I couldn't put the pain of those cuts on the backs of those struggling the most. And what I actually felt I needed to do was double down and invest more in the people and communities hardest hit by COVID. So, one day, I'm sitting at my desk, yet again, pouring through those spreadsheets, trying to figure out if there are any additional dollars, anything I had missed before, that I could put towards the economic crisis. And I hone in on a section of the budget for giveable loans, one of those incentives I was telling you about. And I notice that there's a business, an international business that we had attracted to the city years back, and they had yet to draw down on their half a million dollar forgivable loan. That had been a really nice win, bringing that company to Philadelphia. But in that moment, all I could think about was the contrast of that company's multi-billion dollar budget and the decimation of my own budget. And so, in that moment, we did something that I never thought we'd do. We picked up the phone and we called that company and we asked them if they would consider for going the half a million dollars so we could provide those dollars to businesses on the brink of collapse. And you know what? 
they didn't hesitate to say yes. I was so grateful, but in that moment, I realized that when we had made that commitment to that company, we had prioritized a company that didn't have to think twice about foregoing a half a million dollars instead of providing it to small businesses for whom a fraction of those dollars could have made all the difference. What could a half a million dollars invested in small businesses have produced over all those years? More neighborhood jobs, a revived commercial corridor, maybe some second locations? Well, we'll never know. And for those who think that this is just the way it's going to be when it comes to cities, there's always going to be poverty and inequality. Well, there are plenty of places that invest more in their people and their communities and they don't have the level of poverty that we do. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, of the 10 wealthiest countries in the world, the United States contributes the lowest share of its GDP to the social safety net. And of those 10 wealthiest countries, places like Australia and the UK and Canada, the United States has the highest level of poverty of them all. And guess what? We're the second wealthiest country in the world. That's unacceptable. I'm not trying to say that countries that invest more in their social safety net don't face problems, because they face plenty of problems. But even when they do face economic hardships, they tend to prioritize their own. For example, when COVID hit, Europe provided funding to their employers so they wouldn't lay off their employees and have them be unemployed and disconnected. And guess what? Europe didn't face a great resignation. So, can we ever have a city without poverty and inequality? Can Philadelphia ever lose its title of poorest big city in America? Well, we'll never hit zero. No place ever will. But we certainly can do much better than we're doing today. But we have to invest intentionally in equitable economic development and in the communities and people that experience the biggest disparities. And studies back this up. A recent report by McKinsey shows that if we were to invest in reducing the racial wealth gap, it could contribute $2 to $4 trillion annually to the United States economy. $2 to $4 trillion. Now I know, you might be thinking, but we have to prioritize growth by bringing new companies because Philadelphia needs those jobs and we need the revenue. And let's face it, we're not the easiest place to do business. But if we prioritize bringing new jobs when most Philadelphians can't access those jobs and can't benefit from that growth, then our poverty rate is not going to go down and our disparity is going to increase. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that growth is critically important. I mean, I was the Commerce Director after all. And I also believe that Growth can bring equity and inclusion, but only if we're intentional about that growth. And if we're not intentional, we've seen it can bring more disparities. Now let me close with a few examples of how we can center equity in economic development. When COVID hit, I told my team, we're not going to invest any more dollars in forgivable loans for the foreseeable future. Let's take those dollars and invest them intentionally and equitable economic development. Let's grow our economy from the ground up. So we created a program called Philadelphia Most Diverse Tech Hub, where we invested in black and brown tech companies and diversifying our tech workforce. We invested more in small businesses. We even had a program for barbershops and salons in the neighborhoods. We made our grant processes simpler. We made the grant applications available in Spanish and in Mandarin, and instead, of prioritizing first come, first serve for the grants, we prioritize the hardest to reach because we all know who gets there first. And that's the gap we need to fill. The private sector also invested more intentionally. A group of employers got together and committed to hiring people based on their skills rather than their educational credentials. And a group of banks committed $100 million to supporting black and brown businesses. Those are the types 
of intentional investments that we need to make to foster equitable and inclusive growth. We have to accept the fact we have not gotten this right. And now is the time to change that. And you don't have to be a senior official in city government to make an impact. Trust me, having left that seat, I know more than ever the impact that an engaged resident or stakeholder can make. You can use your voice and advocate. You can use the power of the pen and you can write an op-ed or a letter to an elected official. You can use your bank account or your wallet, and you can support black and brown businesses or important causes. An industry can coordinate to provide more economic opportunities to those who haven't had them and pay living wages. And stakeholders from all backgrounds can break down silos and work together to fight poverty. We can all contribute to equitable cities. We have to move from a trickle-down model to a sprout-up model. Because here's the thing, if you invest in growth, it doesn't necessarily result in equity. But if you invest in equity, it will lead to growth.